Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, okay, I, I, what I want to try and do is just address these issues because um, they are interesting in themselves. So it's kind of like a whirlwind tour, tour, you know, across patterns and then go towards uh, some behaviour or some um, research that I've been engaged in myself, a programme of research, which I'll explain later, which kind of goes from more macro to micro level. So um, I need to um, uh, just mention my... Uh, uh, my funders, uh, the Irish Research Council funded the programme twice, the, um, also Chagas and then the National Disability Authority uh, funded a follow-up study of this of a group that I'm going to talk about and then um, Fulbright, um, they uh, gave me a, a fellowship to go to Berkeley to look at these kind of issues in international terms So, um, and also I want to uh, mention my co-authors uh, in relation to the Chagas study, Maria Feeney and Anya McInwald. So, um, right, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a, it's paradoxical in one way when you even look at the area of suicidal behaviour because in a sense the whole study of suicidal behaviour, as you probably all know, more or less started from one person, you know, certainly theoretically and also empirically, um, and that is Durkheim. And the area still tends to be dominated uh, by him in theoretical terms um, and also um, in uh, methodologically. The, the overwhelming um, majority of studies are quantitative. And, but, and also, um, the other interesting thing is that although Durkheim, as a sociologist, in a sense, began to an extent the study of this area, um, sociological analysis of it is, is quite sparse. It's almost as if sociologists have kind of left that area and they've, it's much more taken up by uh, psychologists um, and um, uh, psychiatry, but particularly psychologists have become very interested in the last while. Um, and of course, there is core to the, the issue as well, that it's, it's, a, it's a challenging area to study. I mean, how do you study this area? Of course, and that's why, in a sense, it's overwhelmingly quantitative, because... Um, one can look at various elements of it, look at it in, in conjunction with other issues in a medical or other environment, but it is a challenging area to study, as, as you will know. Um, and we we'll come to that when I'm describing the entree to a study later on. So, um, but there are, although it is dominated by a particular perspective, there are, other, there are alternative theoretical and methodological uh, approaches, and notably that of Jack Douglas, who... In a sense, um, in the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, uh, you know, produced a piece of work which he started out, in a sense, to um, address Durkheim's work, to rebut it, in a sense, um, and develop then um, both a, an alternative theoretical perspective on it, um, as well as um, an, another way, a qualitative way, he advocated a qualitative way of looking at it. So... In, in Douglas's terms, suicide is a meaningful act. It's rational also, but it's a meaningful act. And you should examine it, that the, that the analysis should be by examining the suicidal action um, on the part of individuals, he says, because it's a form of cultural communication. And you're going to learn about uh, various societies in that way. And um, he felt that a better approach, or at least a complementary approach, was to look at, um, to do it qualitatively, and that was the analysis of near-fatal attempts, because that's about as close as you're going to be able to come to be able to look at um, suicidal, you know, serious suicidal behaviour. So just to look at some uh, interesting patterns, um, suicide rates have been really rising from the mid-20th century, but not globally. They have been rising more in um, wealthier kind of countries. That the patterns... Uh, the patterns that we've come to know about suicide, suicidal behaviour, suicide rates really, um, are the patterns essentially of the developed world. Um, and the, because the rates vary across and within countries very extensively. Um, you'll see now, I'm going to show you an illustration from the WHO. But even in areas that would be very close to each other, for example... Uh, the Inuit of, of Canada, North Canada, um, there are various communities and they've been studied extensively and the variation in rates amongst them is really very significant from very high rates to extremely low rates. Um, so that even in a kind of a, a very uh, selected kind of area they can vary greatly and of course they vary across countries as you know. 
And what is apparent, um, and we look at other factors that have been associated with this, but different cultural meanings are, are quite definitely attached to suicide. I mean, it's divided sometime in terms of where you have a cultural environment where suicide is prohibited. Um, or you might have, in general terms, a suicide, um, a, an environment where suicide, it, there's a more permissive attitude towards suicide. And they would be two very large general differences. Um, but what is, um, is really key in terms of looking at uh, suicide rates across the world um, is that economic development or GDP is a key factor um, in relation to these patterns. The higher rates are essentially in high income countries. You don't have the same kind of patterns in low income countries. Um, and the, the high male to female ratio, which is a very well known pattern that's discussed often in the media and elsewhere, that is primarily in high income countries. So um, economic development, as I said, it really does divide up. And in the, um, a major report which came out from the WHO uh, last year, it looks at all of these various different areas across the world and specifies the different rates, and it's quite interesting data. Um, there are also considerable age variations. It's not just the, that the rates overall vary, but there's considerable age variations, and they tend to relate to level of um, the GDP in the country as well. So generally, if you look globally, um, suicide is more prevalent amongst older groups, as would be the kind of general thinking. But um, a high proportion of young deaths, that is in 15 to 29 years, um, you see that in that pattern in high income countries. So you're beginning to see that there's a different pattern to, uh, to suicide in high income countries um, in the so-called West. Now, there also have been very kind of significant historical variations. As you know, Su uh, Durkheim said that suicide rates tend to remain stable, and they do. But of course, over time, they do change. And there have been very definite uh, changes in suicide um, patterns over time, especially from the, the late 19th century. So that in the middle of the 20th century, we began to see quite a, a change, again in more developed countries, in terms of age. So the, um, the usual pattern of older people uh, was replaced in, as I said again, high GDP countries by uh, younger people uh, completing suicide. And then, um, although uh, in Durkheim's time and the time of the, the social statisticians, um, suicide was seen, as you know, as a disease of civilization, and so all of this kind of data was surrounding it. And one of the the uh, premises here was that it was much higher. Suicide was much higher in urban areas um, than it was in rural areas. Now there was some inconsistent evidence around that time, but generally the data did seem to uh, support the idea that it was more an urban phenomenon. But that, in fact, has been reversed now in most countries, that uh, it's higher in rural areas. And it tends to be higher, as you know, in, in rural Ireland and also in, in the UK as well. The other uh, difference since Durkheim's time is in terms of it was associated with wealth, whereas now it tends to be more associated with poverty and with, um, with lower socioeconomic groupings. So um, this is a kind of a major change in the pattern historically. And of course, there have been huge, although you do have stability of rates, there have been major changes in national uh, patterns of suicide over 100 years or so. So that, for example, rates in France, rates in Italy, rates in the UK, uh, they were lower in the 1980s than they were in, at, in 1900. So, you know, there's been big changes. And another country, for example, such as Finland, um, that would had a very low rate at the end of the 19th century, but by the end of um, the 20th century, it had one of the highest in Europe. So there have been all these changes. And so there, I suppose they're supporting to an extent what Durkheim said. You know, there are national and cultural issues attached to suicide patterns. They are relatively stable, but they certainly change. And of course, the other major um, kind of pattern, which in a sense that you know, Durkheim predicted didn't happen. He would, I mean, if it was true that social change was going to cause an increase, as was his hypothesis in terms of suicide rates, well, then we should have had continuingly high rates across Europe, across, uh, particularly across Europe in the 
20th century, but that didn't happen because, in a sense, there were really quite strong variations across Europe. It didn't happen that way because other factors kicked in um, uh, to modify suicide rates um, in various countries. So um, it doesn't seem quite as bright there as when I put it on, but it's, it's much brighter on the, um, on the monitor there. But this is from the WHO most recent report in 2014, and it shows data from 2012. And although it's not quite as bright on the monitor, you get an idea of the variation across the world in terms of suicide rates. And you can see that there are areas that have significantly high rates, and there are areas that obviously uh, veer around the middle, and then those who have lowish suicide. And then there's a few where data is not available, and that sometimes would be connected to religious kind of environments, etc. But again, it highlights that there really is very significant variation. Now, here's another interesting one because um, of the patterns in suicide, one of the major ones is this male-female ratio, and um, that there is a much higher um, a much higher prevalence of suicide amongst men than in relation to women. And yes, there is, but again, as I said, that is more a pattern of high GDP countries. Now, this shows the, um, the male-female ratio, again, it's from the WHO, and um, of age standardised suicide rates in 2012. And you can see that there are areas, and one of the notable areas in relation to um, this ratio is China, where, in fact, the opposite is true, where you have four times as many women uh, completing suicide as you do men. So, although the male, um, the, the, it does tend to have a male excess, one does tend to have a male excess in terms of suicide, it's by no means universal. It certainly is not. And um, there are vast areas, for example, in India, it tends more towards parity. So, there are very large exceptions to this idea. And again, uh, just to state that really that idea of the high male to female um, uh, rates in terms of suicide tend to be that of the high GB, GBP countries. So to look at Ireland, um, they have, the rates here have been rising since the 1970s, which you probably know. And uh, this is just to give you an idea of where they are. There's 554 suicide deaths in 2011. Any of you who've ever looked for data on suicide from the CSO will know that they tend to move around in terms of years. They, there's quite a, um, a lag in terms of when they give uh, data around this. So um, there were 507 the following year in 2012, but this data um, is related to 2011. Um, it's more complete in relation to that. So um, male, as in some of the other Western countries, male rate is five times higher than the female rate here. And, and I think you probably know that from media and other kind of sources. Um, but um, the male rate, interestingly, is highest in the 45 to 64 age group, where the male, female highest in, in that age group. Now, if we look at this, it shows where we're kind of cited in the, 28, uh, in, the, in the 28 member states of the EU. And you can see that we're relatively low down, that, um, you know, in terms, in a ranking order. And um, again... Sometimes uh, these kind of issues are not really uh, publicised that well because suicide, and I think um, you know, this was mentioned uh, when the other paper was given on suicide, that it's an incredibly political issue, an incredibly political issue. So sometimes the some of the data that is there is not really, it's, let's say the emphasis is put on certain issues rather than others. So it is an issue. It certainly is an important public health issue and also... Um, it is something that doesn't, doesn't just concern the individual, it ripples out and concerns the family and the community in a, wider, in a wider kind of dimension. But at the same time, in health terms, if you're looking at this in cold, stark health statistics, it is a relatively small issue. But as I said, it is very, uh, a very sensitive issue and it's very, very political, um, as I know from various connections. Now, Here's just some um, data I put together from, this is from the 1950s. Again, it's to show you um, how it began to rise, or the point it did in the 1970s. And it shows three things. Important. And you can see that I had um, illustrations for way beyond that into the 19th century, but we're, I'm trying to move along quickly, quicker here. So you can see it was very stable, really, up to this point. And I know some of you might think, well, that was because of reporting. But no, there's been some analysis done around this, so it's not 
um, it's not just about reporting. There was a, a definite rise from the 1970s. Now, you can see also that the rise is essentially a, a rise in male suicides, and that that's what it was. The female rate has remained relatively stable and low. It's a, it, has, it was a rise, the rise in the 1970s was a rise in male suicide. So what are the kind of influences? Uh, what, what, if you look at the literature, if you look at the data that's out there, what are the causes of, um, of rising suicide rates? What are the, the hypotheses that have been put forward? Well, I've, I've grouped them into two major areas, and this is where they, they really do sit. And economic factors. And there's been a lot of analysis around this area. Um, for example, in terms of socioeconomic disruptions, when the, after the fall of the, Berlin, of the Berlin Wall, when you had a lot of societal and economic disruption in um, Eastern European countries, and they have been studied extensively. And even though there are some patterns, they're not actually consistent. Um, and they've been studied in very, very, um, you know, very elaborate ways and, so, and by many different groups of, of researchers. And it's not absolutely consistent. Um, some countries experienced really very significant rises after that time, whereas others remained relatively stable. So um, it's not absolutely consistent. The other thing is, um, Baudelaire and Estabe, they published a book in 2008 where they, they gave a kind of a major hypothesis, and that was that from the mid-20th century, they say, there's been a transfer or a movement of resources from, um, from younger people to older people, and that in a sense, uh, this is their hypothesis, that younger people are, are missing out relatively uh, from that time on, and uh, this is a more general hypothesis, but they do back it up with fairly good data. Then um, unemployment emerges consistently, and um, sometimes with alcohol uh, consumption, and this is from Brendan and Dermot Walsh, and this was part of the the data that was presented with us, because alcohol has been studied extensively too in Eastern Europe, um, and it has certainly come into the data um, here in Ireland as well. So the other kind of general category would be societal factors, you know, looking at the diminishing influence of religion, which is quite a hard um, analysis because, um, you know, deciding whether it's adherence to religion or, or what exactly are the, is to be the measurement, then changing family forms. Now, Changing family forms is um, quite an interesting one because it's been taken up in this kind of discourse which we would call um, a kind of a crisis masculinity discourse and that is that the kind of family forms that are emerging um, in, Western, in the Western world are in a sense um, omitting the father, omitting the male and that this, um, this is written up in many, in many books around not just around masculinity, but that the challenges for men are resulting in higher suicide rates for men. But these are very kind of widespread, generalised kind of uh, themes. And linked to that also is the idea of uh, women working outside the home, the whole change within the family in terms of that. And of course, that can be related also to economic factors because uh, female labour market participation has been used as a, as a measure as well to analyse these. But there are some findings, but there's nothing absolutely consistent, but economic factors do seem to be important. So then moving along to gender, I mean, what we can see is um, that socioeconomic factors are important, that economic factors are important, but also that gender is obviously an issue because uh, certainly in the Western world, a lot more males complete suicide than do females. So when you look at gender, before we kind of look at some of the aspects in relation to another study, um, it is really interesting to look at the idea because suicide is gendered. It certainly is historically, and, and it is to a certain extent today. There are gendered meanings attached to suicide. Um, one of my colleagues who produced the um, special issue of social science and medicine wrote about this, that you know, he died for glory and she died for love. And there was this narrative that, you know, that in a sense, women um, completed suicide for emotional, for relationships issues. And this, this arises even in Durkheim's work, and that um, males did it for economic or rational reasons, and obviously the opposite is true in terms of irrationality for women. So there are these kind of themes. And but most importantly there, I suppose, the idea that male suicide is heroic. And that emerges in the literature and it emerges in other elements as well. 
you know, that it is the heroic thing to do, and it certainly does. Um, ideas around that still uh, persist. For example, um, research in America has shown that um, the perceptions of males who um, complete suicide, they have a, that there's a, a kind of, they are perceived in a much better way than males who attempt suicide, who, i.e., don't succeed at completing. So that, in a sense, attempted suicide is linked to the female um, completed suicide is seen as a more heroic. Now again, as I say, these might have been more historical, but they certainly do still uh, persist in certain environments. So the first thing though to say when we look at, focus more down on men and suicidal behaviour, is to say that um, not all men are equally vulnerable to suicide. You know, as Baudelaire and Estado said, you know, even though um, countries, rich countries, tend to have higher suicide rates. It's not the rich in those countries who are completing suicide. It is much more uh, the poor, and that is absolutely a definite. That is a definite trend. So, what is it about some men that makes them uh, increases their risk? I mean, most of the quantitative analysis has come up with facts like that they use more lethal methods, etc. But there are other reasons why it um, is happening, and that is what kind of drew me towards um, the analysis of this particular area. So what is it about some men? Well, these are three definite indicators. One is low income and educational attainment, and low educational attainment. Um, another is having made a previous attempt. And another one, which I am um, putting there because of the work that I've done, is particular norms or ideas around masculinity or about how you live your life as a man around manhood. So. Uh, let's look at the socioeconomic status. We've looked at that at more kind of macro and um, global level, but um, in all the data that emerges, it is absolutely clear that um, you know low socioeconomic status is highly correlated with uh, completed suicide, and it comes from the work of uh, Keith Houghton, who's been carrying out longitudinal studies in Oxford for over two uh, more decades. Um, it all, this is just an example of one publication from the British Journal of Psychiatry, which um, also uh, puts that very clearly. Now, Hellowell is one of the more interesting writers in relation to looking at education as a protective feature, and it is very, very definitely a protective feature because um, you know, those in third level, those in university, are much more protected in terms of suicide uh, than those who never uh, go to university. It's a, it's a very protective environment. And here's another interesting study by Corcoran and Aronsman in 2010. They looked at uh, the effect of unemployment, which they, they thought what they, they uh, concluded was important. But unemployment um, is greater, puts a person at greater risk when the national level of unemployment is low. So that was quite an interesting. They looked at over the Celtic Tiger. And so some groups of men are more at risk when they're in particular social, particularly economic environments. And then when the rest of the economy is doing well and they're not, um, then they're even more at risk um, according to that paper. Now, this is um, the CSO don't provide data um, on maybe some years later, but they don't generally provide data um, on socioeconomic grouping and suicide. But this is just some data they gave me for 2000. Well, they actually gave me over a few years, but it, had, it doesn't change dramatically. But what is interesting about um, this is the unknown category. Now, I, um, the, the study that I'm going to describe to you in a moment, I did that um, while also um, doing, I did part of the research in the CSO. And I know that that um, is only because those people were unemployed or had not had any employment for quite a long time. And that's why it's unknown, because um, it's based on coroner's records and the, the whole profile is quite extensive. So you can see um, that there's a very kind of clear uh, pattern here, but that the unknown is most likely to include people who, ha who do not work and have not worked for quite some time. So they are very significant. It might, yes, but you know the number of people, the age group tends to be somewhat low. But you're right; it would include pensioners. But um, it's mostly. I saw them. I saw the the data myself. I saw the actual files, so I can see that. So um, let's look at repetition of that. That is a real risk factor. Um, Fifty to sixty-six percent of those who complete suicide had have had a previous deliberate self-harm. 
episode. Now, this is an area, this makes the whole area difficult to study as well because deliberate self-harm is a very kind of wide span of activity, a very wide span of behaviour. It goes from people who make so-called minor, um, minor uh, kind of uh, attempts uh, to those who make near fatal attempts. And the data that's gathered in Ireland, while it's very, very good by the National Suicide Research Foundation, tends to include this spectrum. And that's, um, it's quite difficult then to, to work with it in that way. So risk is increased when, the, uh, when the, there's males involved, when it's low income, when alcohol or substance misuse, especially of a serious level, is included, and when it's a medically serious suicide attempt has, has happened. Those together really do increase the, uh, the possibility of um, completing suicide. Now, just to mention here, there is this so-called gender paradox in relation to suicidal behaviour, and that is supposedly that males... Uh, complete suicide. They are the ones high up in relation to that. And females are the ones who attempt. Females are the ones who engage in deliberate self-harm. And that is a pattern certainly you do see in the Western world. But if you look at this, it is not, it is no longer a definite pattern in Ireland. Because over the last 10 years, we've seen a very, very significant rise in, um, in male Attempt, it may, male deliberate self-harm attempts, whatever the, the uh, area in the spectrum they are. But there has been a huge rise in, uh, and that is very unusual. It's not, it is in, in somewhat in Finland, but it's not really across uh, the other European countries. So there's something specific about Ireland, about Irish culture, about Irish society over the last while, which is giving rise to, to this particular pattern which, which has emerged. And as I said, it's relatively unusual. Now, I was at um, a research meeting there a few days ago, and some people see this as a kind of protective feature, that because males are engaging in less serious forms of deliberate self-harm, then somehow it's protecting them from going further. Now, whether you could look at that, I don't know. So I want to move on to this um, part of this study that I've been engaged in looking at, and this was the, the baseline study. It was a consecutive sample of 52 male hospital admissions. Um, it was, they all had uh, engaged in a serious episode. They were mostly uh, near fatal attempts, um, but there was a high level of attempt, intent as well. They were between, I controlled for age, they were between 18 and 30. It was a qualitative methodology. In fact, it was an entirely unstructured interview format in that um, when, I, when I met them for the first time, um, I only asked them one specific question, and that was, can you tell me how you came to be admitted here? Because I wanted them to describe and define exactly what the, the behaviour was. So they were generally interviewed, depending on the, uh, the um, injury, they were generally interviewed within 24 hours, but as you can imagine, that was not always possible in terms of their injuries. But um, I tried to interview them as soon as possible. So when you look at this, I'm, I'm just giving a few um, findings in relation to this, um, because I want to talk also about the follow-up study. But firstly, the thing that emerged was that they tended to have um, low socioeconomic backgrounds and below national average in terms of educational attainment. So as a group, they tended to rank uh, below the national average in educationally and also in uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, the other thing that was important, which when you're looking at the pathways to suicide, was that the timing of the action was often impulsive. Um, but long-term ideation was always present. In fact, the ideation, the thinking about suicide, you, was usually there for one to two years. And what happened was there was incremental planning. So that when people sometimes refer to suicide um, or suicide behaviour as impulsive, the actual action may be impulsive, but not in a sense the plan. All of the pieces are there, and it can happen this week rather than next week, but it is all worked out, and it goes on over a long time. And this allied with the next feature, which emerged, emerged in thematic analysis, uh, non-disclosure of distress, these two work together in a fairly lethal way to ensure that they went um, a much longer way in terms of um, engaging with this behaviour. So why did they, again, just briefly addressing the, why did they um, 
you know, absolutely refused to discuss or even imply there was anything wrong. It was because of a number of features, and one of them was um, that it implied weakness. It absolutely, the vast majority of them felt they had to be responsible as men, they had to be, had to be able to, um, you know, have their family look up to them, um, whether they were in, gay, in a relationship or whether they were um, children or whatever in a family, they felt they had to be responsible, that they had a particular role if they were a man. Um, so you had to be strong and you had to be able to manage. Well, now, this was also obviously influenced by the environment they lived in, etc., etc. Um, and weakness uh, was related to something females were more likely to disclose and they were more, so in a sense, disclosing uh, distress was linked to being female and that was uh, linked to uh, weakness, uh, weak kind of behaviour. Uh, behaviour which was regarded as non-masculine, uh, not connected to being a man. Now, again, just one or two other features. They were not isolates. They were people who were engaged with other people in all kinds of ways. But confiding in other men was not an option. Now, some of them described trying to raise the issue, generally when they were sitting on a bar stool um, on a Saturday night in a pub, and trying to somehow raise the issue of distress. But um, they were very quickly given the, uh, the idea that this was not something that they, the person wanted to share with them. So, in a sense, there were very strong codes around discussing um, distress amongst these men and their friends. So, and it was because, again, because really, in a way, it was connected, as I said, with this idea of being weak. And so they didn't, although they, they had friends, they didn't discuss it with them. But skipping on, really, as you can imagine, when you have this level of distress over one to two years, and you, there is no outlet for it, and you are not discussing in any kind of way, and certainly not uh, you know, introducing an intervention, um, in fact, the opposite is true. There is a very strong pressure to maintain a performance of normality, and this was what some of them did. Some of them went to the extreme of being the life and soul of the party in order to ensure that their performance of normality was believed by the people around them, when all the time uh, they were uh, like this, um, this guy described there. But of course, when you're trying to maintain a, um, a performance of normality when you are at that real high level of distress and um, anxiety, well then the only way really to try and survive is by self-medicating with drink and or drugs and that was the way that they did try and survive. But of course that is not going to work in the medium and certainly not in the long term. So what happens then is well described in the literature, um, you know, both in the psychological and the, the sociological literature, when options begin to narrow. And there is a kind of a cognitive narrowing in, uh, as well as in other kind of ways. And, you know, everything really, there there's, doesn't seem to be any way out of it. And um, this is uh, one of the respondents describing this. Um, there just didn't seem to be any possibility of relief. And since he, he certainly wouldn't take on the idea of an intervention or discussing with somebody, he felt he couldn't do that, so therefore um, it leads to a very toxic kind of environment. So when you look at, so that's more like the process and the pathway towards it, but when you look at why, the kind of categorizations from the analysis of why they uh, attempted suicide, well, they fall into these kind of um, categories. Firstly, um, this kind of rather nebulous kind of category of unhappiness with life, and this would turn out to be a very important category um, in the longer term. Um, either they were embedded in a risk lifestyle and they felt that they couldn't find their way out of that, um, or there was transitional anxiety, especially the, among some of the younger ones who were leaving school, who were, wanted to move to university, who wanted to go on, but just didn't feel that they were going to make it. And um, anxiety really overcame them at that point. Then there were relationship and sexual, sexuality challenges. The relationship um, issues were important, so it really knocks on the head the idea that uh, relationship um, is not an important kind of issue um, in relation to this for men. Then there were those which, again, described in the literature where they were trapped in a very specific uh, kind of situation. Sometimes that was related to the first one, but these were, it was a very specific categorization as well. And at the bottom, and the least important, was psychiatric disorder. Because um, 
only a very small group of these people um, suffered from an ongoing, what we would refer to as a serious psychiatric disorder. The vast majority did not. And they were assessed in, te these were teaching hospitals, they were assessed fairly um, consistently. And what emerged from, some of them came, um, when you looked at their diagnosis, they had no diagnosis, a small group of them. Others had diagnoses like um, transient mild depression. But of course, if you present with a, a, you know, a near fatal suicide attempt, you're highly likely to tick boxes in terms of um, having some kind of transient uh, depression at the very least. But um, this data, as you can imagine, has been presented to the hospitals concerned, and they would definitely concur, the senior staff would definitely concur with this kind of pattern that, that I found. So um, in, at seven, average seven years, I followed up these people. And uh, the good news was that um, just over half had not made any subsequent episodes. Um, then 19 had made a subsequent episode, but they were still alive. But six of them had completed suicide. Now, that rate is incredibly high. Um, these are the other two studies that come anyway close to having the same kind of level um, of completion uh, after some years. Um, but the, um, that level, and of course it was high because I was controlling for some very, very important risk factors. They were male, they were low socioeconomic group. I wasn't controlling for that, but that's what emerged. Um, and they made a near fatal attempt. So those factors made them a very high at risk group. And so it turned out in relation uh, to the follow up. Anne, um, yeah. there was a study um, done in Glasgow of NEETS. And um, they went back 10 years later um, to, you know, who had um, made su an attempted suicide. When they went back 10 years later, 15% of them were dead. And was this some kind of disadvantaged? Yeah, yeah. yeah so they weren't em employed, yeah. they weren't in education, training yeah. services, so yeah. they were marginalised on yeah. the margins of society. But, I mean, 15% is, is high as well. Yeah, it is. And... Um, well, certainly when I was writing this up for a paper on the follow-up, it, it was very, very high in relation to the others. Now, this is just a simple table, and it indicates to you that even with these relatively small numbers, you can see that those who repeated and those who didn't subsequently repeat, that there were quite definite differences between them. And even though relatively they had low levels of education, the non-repeaters tended to be, have a better level of education uh, relative to the others. The other thing that's interesting as well is if you look at the reasons, um, the people who didn't complete, it tended to be more a specific reason or something that was very specific in their life. The ones who it was more general unhappiness, where it was a more kind of nebulous category, those, they were much more at risk for, for repeating. So, as I said, even in this relatively small group, you can see, you can see a pattern. So that the, those who repeated and completed, then if, you do, if I, look, I looked at the, the group, the six who completed, it's a very small uh, group, and of course you end up doing more or less case analysis, but um, they lacked education resources, this group, the repeat group, they, um, alcohol and drug misuse was much more a feature of their lives. It was much more um, a serious, consistent kind of issue. Um, the reason for the action, as I just said, there was general more than specific. And the intensity of the unhappiness, the helplessness, the inability to find your way out of this particular life, uh, which was the big issue for, these, um, for this group, uh, was much greater for those who completed when I looked at that, at their particular Data. The, this data, by the way, the interviews went on for two, sometimes three hours, and, um, and only one person refused to be interviewed, which was quite interesting when you think about um, how much they had, uh, you know, avoided talking about the issue up to then. Um, but so suicide, as Schneidman and other people have described it, is it became an escape from an unbearable situation. But it wasn't just an escape. It was sometimes a positive action. Um, from somebody who really had no other uh, control mechanisms in, at, their, uh, at their disposal. And there was also uh, involved in it a failure to reach the masculine ideal, they were a failure to live up to their own idea of being a man, being able to work, etc., etc. 
And this is just a quote from uh, Debbie Gaines, who said that suicide is potentially comforting if you're disconnected, dislocated and have no power. And I suppose what I'm trying to say here is that people complete suicide for many different individual reasons, but there are patterns. But to put it all down to, um, to uh, mental illness is really missing um, a major point. And um, here's just some quotes that you might um, be able to have, kind of have a glance at. These are people who complete it. And it gives you some idea of the extent of their, um, their desperation. And they were, it really was quite extreme. But they still did. Yeah, but it just means, you know, if they happen together, it doesn't mean one is the cause for the other. How are these people dismissed from hospital and not, you know, do they not get, are they not offered? Yes. Well, yeah. Okay. They were all given, they were all attending teaching hospitals. They would have been one of the best services. It, it wasn't just one hospital. They would have been regarded as probably the best services in the amongst, certainly amongst the best services in the country. They were all given on discharge, and they were in hospital for a while, some of them, but they were on discharge, they were given emergency follow-up um, appointments within 24 hours. They had people visit them to ensure that they that would go to the outpatients, and yet a third never went near the outpatients. So they didn't want to go. And those who uh, did go tended, quite a lot of them dropped out fairly quickly, and they self-discharged themselves. So uh, the environment of that, although it had been a very cathartic um, event for most of them, uh, certainly they didn't see somehow um, that kind of particular counselling they were being offered as somehow helping them at that point. So they didn't take up the treatment generally, but they certainly were offered it. And it wasn't just uh, they were told, go down to the OPD. There, was a, there were special nurses in this environment who went out to see them and um, encouraged them to try and go. So there was an active kind of thing. So and is there any relationship between treatment and the eventual outcome in terms of...? The, um, to, there is to an extent. Um, most of the people, there, yeah, it is true that most repeaters did not re-engage, most of them. But the most protected group, uh, there, there's one small group here, and none of them completed suicide, and that were the they were the people who had a serious mental illness. And they were the people who were most engaged with the hospital. So they tended to, um, you know, they, some of them did repeat, but at the same time, in the long term, their engagement with the hospital was much more secure in long term. And they actually ended up being the group that were, there were none of them, as I said, completed suicide. Um, but so in conclusion, um, so low socioeconomic and gendered health beliefs are key in terms of certainly pathways to suicide. This is what emerged from both this study, there's also a study of, of uh, rural men um, in terms of suicide behaviour. Um, and it certainly is important. Um, wh how are they connected? Well, what I would say is that, and this is what they told me, it, it's developed more in the papers attached to this, and that is that, you know, when you're in certain environments, um, there's less freedom about expression. And we know that there are particular cultural uh, beliefs about how one should behave, how men should behave, and they are more inflexible in some environments and more flexible in others. And... Um, so I think that is how they worked together. There was a lot of surveillance of behaviour. They perceived there was a lot of it. When, when they talked about, you know, disclosing distress as connected to weakness, they talked about uh, the surveillance of behaviour and how men were expected to uh, conform to pretty rigid ideas about how men are um, in their particular environments. Now, uh, so, you know, I think that this kind of behaviour is is certainly not general to all men, not in any way. But I think that there are particular um, environments, particular pockets of masculinity that where more traditional forms of masculinity um, are more likely to be played out. 
Um, and I do think that obviously lack of resources, economic, social, and they go with some of the other points we're talking about. But what was really amazing was they also they lacked social and economic resources to an extent, but they also lacked emotional resources because many of them um, they didn't understand their emotional life or their psychological life. They didn't, they didn't understand, for example, what a panic attack was, or they didn't have any idea um, about it. They, they knew very little about their emotional lives. And of course, that was because, obviously, they had never um, had an environment where they could discuss it. But they certainly lacked um, that kind of emotional capital. And then what happens is that if there is these kind of issues or factors are there, and somebody engages in a near fatal attempt, well then it puts them at even more at risk because they feel they have let themselves down even more so. And certainly the people who repeated that I interviewed said that. Um, and the options narrow. And then what happens is they tend to draw from whatever the script, if there is a script around suicide behaviour in a country. And I'm just concluding with this. Um, this really does indicate that there is a much more familiar script around suicide now. It's much more so-called normalised in Irish society. This, though, comes from the rural study. And it is um, from a young man in his 20s uh, who had been unemployed. Um, and then he was offered, he had to go back to, um, to training, which he didn't want to do. And then, as he said... You know, when I was thinking about it, the, the suicide seemed like a more natural option, really, than trying to go to college. Um, it was always there in my head, and then he began to put together the particular, um, more definite ideas about it. So in the rural studies, it's exactly the same, that kind of long period leading up to it. Um, but certainly the plans, the suicidal ideas had been there for quite some time. Okay. Thank you.